Welcome to the third part of our module M5, Urban Planning and Participatory Planning. Participatory planning is an urban planning paradigm that emphasizes involving the entire community in the strategic and management processes of urban planning or community level planning processes, urban or rural. It is often considered as part of community development. Participatory planning aims to harmonize views among all of its participants, as well as prevent conflict between opposing parties. In addition, marginalized groups have an opportunity to participate in the planning process. Take a look at this animation. Pudong, famous district of the city of Shanghai, China, experienced a rapid development. Former farmland changed into one of the most important economic centers and financial hubs in the world. Many other cities in China have been undergone the same development since Deng Xiaoping's catchword of 1979, one country, two systems. As mentioned before, Shenzhen is one of those cities. So there's a little task for you. How about participation and sustainable aspects in the planning of Shenzhen? To provide further insight, please click on the link below and read The Role of Planning in the Development of Shenzhen, China, Rhetoric and Realities. This reading will take approximately 45 minutes with individual extra time for notes and further reading. Sherry R. Arnstein is the author of the highly influential Ladder of Citizen Participation. She makes the argument that, 1969 in the US, much supposed citizen participation was in fact little more than lip service. She claimed that there is a critical difference between going through the empty ritual of participation and having the real power needed to affect the outcome of the process. The progression to more tokenistic participation sees those in positions of authority appearing to listen citizens having the opportunity to hear and sometimes be heard. But without any power to ensure that their views are taken on board and acted upon, in these situations citizens lack power or muscle and placatation sees citizens invited to advise while those in authority retain the right to make decisions. Towards the top of the ladder is the real dizzy heights of participation with increasing level of influence and citizen power within decision making. Partnerships allow citizens to negotiate, engage and trade with those in authority whereas delegated power and citizen control sees a genuine transfer of power and decision making capabilities to citizens. To the top of the ladder where citizens hold full managerial power and responsibility. To provide further insights, please click on the link below and read the full article by Sherry R. Arnstein, A Ladder of Citizen Participation. Now from theory into practice. The squatters' movement since the end of the 1970s can be seen in a historical sense as an initial ignition of urban processes in social and sustainable transformation. Empty, abandoned buildings or surfaces were taken by informal groups in possession. The majority of the occupants often had a social as well 
as an ecologically friendly pretension. This affected at least the processes of transformation. Valuable old buildings could be preserved in this way, were renovated later, often energy efficient and socially acceptable. Free surfaces and fallows were supplied, for example, for an informal garden use and thus became biotopes important for the urban climate. At first, the authorities tried to remove the squatters from the building of fallow ground with the help of the police. These governmental actions evoked, and still evoke, harsh reactions by the squatters and their sympathizers. To appease the riots and the public disorder, stakeholders started to talk, to negotiate and finally to participate. This model became more common in Western societies and had its influence also in municipal politics. The acceptance increased in the general public and for citizens it became easier to participate. But on the other hand, for local authorities it became more difficult to achieve their objectives. Now let's talk about public participation in practice. Here is an example of the top-down approach. German planning rules are written down at Baugesetzbuch. I would like to quote the official rules for participation according to the Department for Urban Development and the Environment in Berlin. During the first phase of public participation, which takes place at an early stage of the planning process, the public are informed about proposed modifications to the land use plan, the general planning objectives, alternative solutions and possible repercussions of the proposed modifications. You can put forward your own proposals and comments on the modifications during this early stage to be considered during the revision of the first draft. Important statements relating to environmental issues will then be put forward for public comment during the second participation stage. During the second phase of public participation, the revised draft is put on public display together with a written statement an environmental impact assessment and other statements on environmental matters already available. Please note, if a simplified modification procedure is adopted, an environmental impact assessment is not required. During the participation period, usually one month, comments from the public will again be received. These are taken into consideration when the arguments for and against the proposed modification are finally waged up. Comments which have not been received before the published deadline may be excluded from further consideration. If the public wishes to participate, the authorities can only consider their comments if they will give their full name and address. In addition, they need to know exactly which modification the citizens are commenting on, so that they have to state the number of that modification. Now there is a little task for you again. How about your country? Plus, for German participants, please add further information. And to provide further insights, please click the button below and read Land Use Planning. Now let's take a look to the other side. Bottom-up planning is undertaken by single groups, persons, NGOs or societal stakeholders. It can arise out of illegal activities like house squatting as well as from ideas, wishes and desires within the neighborhood.
discussions with owners or local authorities are starting from different side, bottom up. There is no top-down planning from above. Success and non-success depends on negotiation skills, local support and democratic structures. The strongest instrument, if available, is the referendum. To provide further insights, please click on the links and read the article We are the City and check the website of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Collaboration and Development. Time to mention some examples for good practice. Number one, a former shopping mall called Friedrichstraßenpassagen. There was a partial demolition of the building, but not during World War II. After the wall broke down, it was occupied by the group Künstlerinitiative Tacheles on February 13th in 1990, two months before the planned demolition. This demolition was not delayed, however. The group managed to get the Berlin Round Table to issue a last-minute injunction. The lease with the property owner expired in 2008 and the future of the art centre became uncertain. After pressure from the owner, the remaining 40 to 60 artists left peacefully in the year 2011. You might say that this wasn't a good practice at all, but at least 22 years of almost legal use had been achieved due to participatory discussions and negotiations. Number two, the Tempelhof Airfield. It was the central airport for the city of Berlin. The huge building is another symbol of gigantic Nazi planning. In 2008, Tempelhof Airport was finally closed. There have been many plans for the post-airport usage, but due to the engagement and the participation of the public, a referendum was held. The majority voted for usage as a park. The Tempelhof airfield is used by thousands of citizens every day. There are activities like jogging, biking, skating, kiting, baseball or urban gardening. About 80% of the former airfield is an important habitat for several red-listed birds, plants and insects. And, at least, it is also a shelter for more than 1,200 refugees. This is the end of Lecture 3. To provide further insights, please read Part 2, Setting the Scene, and Part 4, Meeting the Digital Age in New Approaches to Urban Planning. You'll find that if you click on the link below. And again, maybe the next video will be also very, very helpful. At least, I would like to show our own video. It shows good practice of a bottom-up, grassroot participatory planning in consideration of sustainability and, of course, its three pillars – the economic, social and environmental pillar. So please click on the link above and enjoy. Don't forget to press the button for the subtitles, because this film is recorded in German. And, by the way, thank you very much for attending my presentation.